Just briefly, I'm a native of Jacksonville, Florida, another Southerner. I have many recollections of racial discrimination, walking through the department store, not being able to drink from the water fountain that said white only. And as uh, you were told, our parents brought us shoes by tracing an outline on, ours was brown paper. Um, tracing our feet on, on uh, brown paper, took it to the store and bought our shoes. And if they didn't fit, they couldn't take them back. My mother coming home from work, shaking one day like a leaf witness, have, after having witnessed a white hoodlum murder a uniformed black sailor who had just returned home from the Pacific Theater. Traveling through the South without the opportunity to use toilets at gas stations, feeling the uneasiness as we travel through Mississippi with my oldest brother going to Detroit. En route to Detroit from Jacksonville, transferring in Cincinnati, coaches for blacks, the coaches were integrated when you're going north beyond Cincinnati, segregated when you're going south uh, past Cincinnati. Having school books and desks that had been discarded by the white students after having been after they had received new ones. Those are some of the experiences that I had as, and I remembered as I received a, an invitation in 1964 uh, to go to Hattiesburg, Mississippi with, uh, and to participate in the voter registration drive there. In addition to those feelings, I had some current ones then. I had been ordained to ministry eight and a half months earlier, and I was newly married four and a half months earlier than that. So going to Mississippi made me think, am I going to see my wife again? Am I going to see my family again? The invitation came through the Reverend Carl Dudley, who was a senior pastor at Berea Presbyterian Church and my postgraduate urban intern supervisor in St. Louis. Within 24 hours after receiving the invitation with memories of experiences of life in the South fresh in my mind and the mindful prayers, mindful of the prayers and good wishes of members of our congregation, the Presbytery, and with thoughts of my wife Dolores, my loving wife of four and a half months, in response to the call of the Voter Registration Committee in Hattiesburg and the National Council of Churches, I boarded the plane for Hattiesburg to join with about 25 other clergy from across the country to participate in the voter registration drive, which was in January before the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Most of the clergy were housed in buildings that had served, at, that served as a headquarters for the voter registration drive, but I was in a house down the street in the home of a, an elderly member who was a member of the voter registration committee. The thought and concern that I had going to Hattiesburg were more of a concern that the experience, than the experience itself. There were lo several local residents, other clergy locally and nationally, and a group of brave and rambunctious, rambunctious college students who were both present and involved. During my first three days there, we had a schedule. In the morning, a group of the clergy were assigned to the task of visiting black residents asking them about their voting re registration, uh, if they were registered, and then encouraging them, and if necessary, taking them to the uh, Forest County Courthouse to register, for that was where the registrar's office was located. Another group was assigned to picket the Forest County Courthouse, which was a location of the registrar's office, the court, and the jail. In the evening, we all gathered at a local church for rallies that involved reports of the day prayers, songs, and speeches of encouragement from local and national leadership. Our visits to the homes of residents picketing at the courthouse and our ongoing and our going to the rallies were under constant surveillance of the local police. During the picketing on Wednesday, my third day there, the police decided that there would be a wooden horse barrier, wooden horse barriers placed on the sidewalk to restrict our marching between them thus keeping clear the path of others who had, the, in their words, legitimate business in the courthouse. Wednesday night, the consensus at the meeting was that the next day, the, if the barriers were still there, they would probably be widened and we would need to step in and walk within them. It was recommended and decided that if the barriers, 
that, that we would walk in between them. And being the only African American in that group, you know that I was one of the ones who was volunteered to step in. On Thursday morning, the barriers were still there. And at an agreed upon time, nine of us stepped in and began marching with our placards while at the same time making sure that we were not impeding the entrance of those who wanted to enter the courthouse. Immediately, the police arrested us. What for? Breach of peace, disobeying an officer, and littering, because we laid our signs down along the wall so that others could pick them up. We were processed, put in jail. There were two cells. One cell contained eight clergy and one cell contained one clergy, and I think you can guess who that one clergy was. <laughs> the day of our imprisonment, we were interviewed by the sheriff, whom we assumed to be our enemy, and the FBI, whom we assumed to be our friends. We were wrong about the FBI. Informed information from our interviews with them was shared with the judge who proceeded in order to order us hell for trial. Money for bond was raised by family members, friends, churches, and national offices of our respective religious groups. After being in prison for nine days, a court date was set, and having met the cost of our bond, we were released. Having been in Hattiesburg longer than a week, to the week to which we had committed, we had, to, uh, we had to leave and go home because other clergy had come and had taken our beds. Ultimately, we returned to Hattiesburg for trial, and the judge fined us the cost of the bond, and we were released. Remember, this was January, again, 1964. Let me share with you just one concrete result of, I'm sure, many. In the early 1980s, our family had moved to Oak Park from St. Louis. I served as, board of, as a board member of the Presbyterian Church USA Foundation, and we were meeting in Louisville. And we had a new class of board members coming on. And someone said, we have a, an African-American woman judge from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I said, I've got to meet this woman. <laughs> and I did. And uh, we uh, struck up a conversation. I said, what happened to the woman judge that sentenced us? And she paused. And she said, she died. And she paused again. And she said, and I took her place. In 2000, I invited this woman judge to come and speak to our young adults at the church. I was serving in Chicago at the time. The morning she was to speak, she was, she, we had breakfast with her, and uh, she was carrying around a little package, which no one noticed. So when she stepped into the pulpit to speak, she said, I've been carrying this package around for all morning, and no one has asked me what, what's in it. So she opened it up, and uh, she showed it to us, and it was an, a proclamation from the mayor of the city of Hattiesburg in which the mayor acknowledged that due to our efforts, Judge Deborah Chambers Gambrell was elected the first African-American judge in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1980. And when she presented that to me, I held it up and I said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Amadi, I'm free at last. The point is this. That sometimes important and arduous work takes a long time before the results are in. Given what is happening today regarding voter registration in many states across the country, our work is not yet done. And our next speaker is one who is probably familiar to all of us, if not familiar in person, familiar in name, David Orr is a county, Cook County clerk and principal election official for the Chicago suburbs and the city of Chicago, the third largest election district in the United States, an office he has held since 1991. His service is so popular that he has been re-elected five times with no significant opposition. David came to politics as an independent and served as alderman of Chicago's 49th Ward from 1979 until 1991. He was vice mayor when Chicago Mayor Harold Washington died in 1987, and then served as mayor until Chicago 
Council appointed Mayor Eugene Sawyer. Before his public service, David was a professor of history and urban affairs at Munderland College in Chicago. David is a leader among election administrators and has earned national recognition for launching voter education campaigns and redesigning polling place material aimed at simplifying the voting process. He has recently, re he has relentlessly campaigned to expand the, franchi and the franchise to all who are qualified while at the same time protecting against the electoral corruption that dogged his predecessors. He is particularly well known for his programs to register new voters at sporting events in colleges and for high school seniors. David will speak about progressive voting practices intended to make our democracy as inclusive as possible. Please join me in welcoming Cook County Clerk David Orr to the podium. Remember, remember, I'm not free at last until all of us are free at last. That means throughout this country, until we're all free, we're free at last. Hello, hey, Tim. Dan. How you doing? Okay. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be with this, uh, this group up here. And of course, our, our next guest coming up. Um, incredible history, important history that we're hearing today. And I think it's uh, wise, Rich, and the rest of your committee, the way in which you tied together these cru crucial and heroic uh, struggles that we're hearing about in terms of the history of voting rights and kind of where we are today and what's going on. I, I did have kind of a football analogy, but um, after the way the Bears played today, I'm afraid to use it, but, um, um, you know, but like in football, obviously there's offense and defense. And because the offense, there have been a lot of touchdowns uh, scored in terms of making things better. You know, make, making these voting rights uh, stick and improve. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but there's also the defensive side, and that's simply uh, what we've won, and you'll hear more about that from our next speaker, beating back these vicious attempts at voter suppression around the country. Um, this battle, and I'm not going to say a lot about it because our next guest will, but uh, the battle against voter suppression uh, is really, really important to me. Because uh, we know the target of many of these places uh, happen to be African Americans, Latinos, um, in many cases students. Um, uh, you'll hear more about this, but just one example, okay? And Rich mentioned that unfortunately this disgusting court, and I do mean disgusting, uh, allowed Texas's law. When Texas came before, they admitted um, that there was five or 600,000 people that would be disenfranchised if they passed their voter ID law. At the same time, they couldn't prove one single case of voter impersonation, right, which is what supposedly the law is supposed to do. But even worse is, you know, we all try so hard to encourage young people to be involved. So in Texas, if you're a student, and even if you have the State Department of Education ID from Texas, that's no good. You cannot vote with that. You have to go get a new ID. And Texas is a big state. They have a lot of what we call um, areas that don't have any county seats. So in some cases, you can go to 80 miles before you can go buy that document. So you'll hear more about it. But vote if you have an NRA membership card. Well, that's good point. Good point. That are allowed under Texas law. That says a lot. That's right. College IDs are not. Sad, but so true. Uh, Voter suppression, though, is nothing new, um, and not only because of the, the history, but also even um, right, right here in Chicago for a long time, the party in power too often wants to, you know, reduce the uh, effect of the other side. Uh, all those years that you mentioned the city council, uh, there the machine Democrats basically did their best to prevent certain people from voting, sometimes liberals, sometimes independents, but often, often African Americans. You know, even right now what's going on is there's a lot in, quote, our party that want to see a big black turnout in November. We're not working to see a big black turnout in February, okay? The people doing the registration that brought in those 100,000 uh, registrations recently, uh, those were not being helped by a lot of the Democratic committeemen. Those were the activists in the community, just like the Tim Blacks of the world. So we still have a little... Um, unfortunate examples of that. And more recently, it's taken the form, of course, uh, you'll hear about, particularly with the Republican Party and the stuff it's doing all across the 
the country. Um, it's interesting though about the photo ID because it's a very clever marketing tool. Uh, think of it, because a voter impersonation happening, okay, is as likely as getting hit by lightning. And yet still some people of both parties support that idea. The way it infects us here in some ways is that you know, the right wing consistent attacks on government encourages us not to like our government, which also hurts our democracy. Uh, in the same way, these attacks on our democracy and voting encourages people to think, well, the whole system is corrupt, and nowadays, a candidate that loses didn't lose legitimately, must have been something wrong in the system. So that does hurt, I think, the future. Just think of um, Catherine Harris, for example. Just go back a little bit, back in 2000. See, some people often say that, oh, well, everybody involved in kind of my job of running elections, well, they all want to do the best thing, or the right thing. It's clearly not true. Now, most fortunately do, but uh, too many don't. Uh, certain Kathleen Harris in 2000 did her best to do something uh, unfortunate. Or uh, Governor Bush in 2000, uh, whose administration purged 57,000 people from voter lists statewide that same year with the excuse that they were scrubbing felons who were not allowed to vote in, in Florida. But at least 1,100 of those were voters who were not felons. Some were religious leaders, by the way, um, and who should have been eligible. Now, if you remember, that's 1,100 that they could clearly prove. The same time, the victory of uh, margin, margin of victory that was given to elect George Bush at the time was 537 votes. Now, I shouldn't even say that margin because they're the Supreme Court, in a, a really a sick and unprincipled decision, gave the election to, to Mr. Bush. And I'm only going to touch on it briefly. Um, as, as Tim says, it's another story, but the, this other form of voter suppression is a slightly different way. If we don't deal with the crisis of money uh, in our politics, our democracy will continue to wither away. Uh, we've all heard about, um, absolutely, um, when because of uh, Citizens United and McCutcheon and others, and people can actually say, free speech means if I got a billion, I can spend it. If you got 10 bucks, you can spend it. It's seriously eroding what we have. The other effects on that very quickly, and that is another story, is we have these never-ending campaigns, campaigns that go on for months or years. Well, those campaigns, what? Cost a ton of money. Where do you get the money? Nowadays, when both parties go out to solicit candidates, they don't go looking for uh, who's a talented person. Who's a really talented person, maybe limited means? No, they only look for millionaires who can fund their own campaigns. So you have the problem in getting good candidates. You've got these long campaigns that cost an incredible fortune, mostly going to the media that uh, really takes a terribly irresponsible position on it. They collect all these millions and millions of dollars. In fact, when I was on Channel 7 earlier today, I. Uh, I raised that issue about was Channel 7 going to give some of that dirty money back since they all complain about the dirty ads. The answer was no. Um, but, um, and so we have these, uh, these negative ads that are also having a really negative effect. You know, people will say, oh, well, they send to work. Now, they may work, and maybe these negative ads will elect Rauner, maybe they'll elect Quinn. And even if they do work in a certain way, they are destroying the democracy. How does anybody make a judgment? When you're listening uh, hour after hour if you watch TV, how do I know? I mean, one, one candidate says I'm a total jerk, and I say the other candidate's a total jerk. How do we know, particularly when the media stays silent, except for their prejudicial endorsements, they stay silent because they're collecting all the money. So we know there's a lot of things that we have to do, along with the secrecy of the donors, et cetera. Um, so there's many repercussions of this, um, but there are some hopeful things I can only touch on because of time. Uh, overturning Citizens United, there's a strong effort out there to do that, and we have to do it. There's other things getting around these horrendous Supreme Court de decisions about like sm small donor matching. There's a group here in Illinois, uh, I think the League of Women Voters is part of that, is pushing to have, see if we can work that out here. We can work on disclosure and advertising. What if every one of those nasty ads had the list at the bottom, uh, like all the uh, other kind of ads, list at the bottom, the five uh, richest donors, the five donors who spent the most money on these ads. 
Okay, that's one way of, of doing it. Or make the media do our job with our free press and require debates, serious debates, uh, and not that air at three in the morning, which would at least give a, an up, uh, you know, at least a chance to those people that don't have the money. So it may sound daunting all we have to do, but let's look at a few of the things that have been accomplished, I think which is what Rich wants us to talk about. Um, and some of the questions that I believe that people in my office and the riches of the world, the League of Voters, ADA, and many of you in the audience ask ourselves over the years is, okay, so how do we register more people in a safe and inexpensive way? How do we do that? How do we deal with voting since we vote on a work day? What can we do to try and get around that particular problem? We're one of few in the country to do it. Um, how else can we make it convenient? Uh, how can we bring young people into the political process? Uh, how can we improve these goals using technology? And finally, what can we do to improve communication with voters, and in some cases with what we call election judges or poll workers? So I'm gonna run f uh, f um, through a few of those things. You know, one of the most important, which is a classic struggle that came out of the 60s, it didn't happen until President Clinton was president, but the motor voter law. That was the first big, uh, national government attempt, which to say there's more convenient ways to register everyone. And if you remember, because there's people in the audience that do, when that, bat when, when that was passed, okay, by the Congress and signed by the President, there was only two states that put up a really nasty fight, Mississippi and Illinois, okay? Now fortunately at that time, um, Governor Edgar and a guy named George Ryan, who was Secretary of State at the time, they basically said, we don't care court, we refuse to do it. And some people, and I think some in the audience, including the League of Voters, stepped up and said, we're going to sue you. When the Supreme Court said, Mr. Edgar, you don't have the choice to obey laws that you want to. You have to obey the laws that are passed. So they said, well, all right, we'll do it, but we got a great scheme here. It's called two-term, vo two-tier voting. So we'll say, okay, all those thousands of people want to register with a new mode of voter, fine but they won't be able to vote for local elections. They won't be able to vote for mayor or governor. In order to do that, you'd have to register twice. We sued them again, and finally the court said, you have to stop this in Illinois. Motor vote is the law of the land, and unfortunately it's the way now most people in both this country and the state actually register for vote. Also, since then, we've extended uh, the deadline for mail ballots because there's something called provisional voting. Uh, which is a good thing. What it means is sometimes we all make errors. My office makes errors. Um, things can happen. So you go to vote, and before, if we couldn't find you in the list, you go home. That's it. Provisional voting now means if you come to the polling place and the people there can't find your name, um, you can still vote. And then we'll do this process after the election. And in many cases, we do find people that were legitimately registered. If that's the case, we segregate their ballot. Okay, until we've looked at it. If in fact we find them properly registered, we count the ballot. If they weren't properly registered, we'll automatically register for them next time. Because that meant that there was two weeks before elections were finalized, we also added something to do with mail ballots because we get a lot of mail ballots that arrive too late. We even get FedExes that take five or six days, amazingly. So we changed that law. Now it says if you uh, send your mail ballot and you um, postmark on the day before the election, it, we got two weeks for that to arrive. Okay, two weeks for that to arrive. Okay, uh, bigger than that, of course, was in 2006 early voting. Early voting is something we fought hard for because we vote on a work day, unlike most of the rest of the world. We, many of us want to have voting on weekends or voting on a holiday. This time would be great. The election falls on Veterans Day. But we haven't gotten that far, so we find other ways to skin the cat, and that was early voting. And so that was created. It's gone well, and now uh, the legislature's wisdom, and some of you in the Oak Park area are lucky to have a guy named Senator Don Harmon, uh, who does a wonderful job on these voting rights issues in Springfield and uh, partly uh, or largely because of him, we have some of these things. So now with early voting in Illinois, so Illinois is trying to expand things while Texas and others and Wisconsin are trying to narrow them. So now the change for right now, the election, is that early voting next week starts tomorrow, but the final week, that Monday through Friday, it'll go to 7 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. So tough work for us, but good for the voters. 
you'll have a chance to, to go later. And secondly, for the first time, early voting will be available on the Sunday before the election. Okay? Um, now, the, the only thing about that, keep in mind, if you're one of those folks that are out there working folks and encouraging them, is that on Sunday, there'll be less sites. Okay, so there's good news here, but it's a little tricky, so be careful. Less sites. Okay, so ideally don't wait. It's never, never good to wait. Um, also, uh, we've expanded what's called grace period. Um, some of us wanted election day registration, but the legislature wasn't willing to pass it. Uh, until recently. And so over the years, we've had something called grace period registration and voting. So even though the um, traditional cutoff of registration ended October 7th, everybody here in Illinois can still register and vote. It's called grace period, but it's selective sites. So it's not as convenient, but you can tell your friends they can still do that. And for the first time now in Illinois, we will have a pilot program of election day registration. So if you are someone that, for whatever reason, you didn't realize you needed to vote or need to register, you can still do it on election day at limited sites. So you can do that. So those are some of the improvements. Then in 2010, we added mail ballots. So now everybody in Illinois legally can vote by mail. And now we have more than a quarter, and that keeps going up, of people who vote before election day which is really good for those of us that run elections because then our equipment goes farther on election day. For young people, briefly, okay, what have we done? Well, we started the teen judge program. Okay, we needed help in the polling places. We needed young people to deal with the new technology. We want to find a way to get them involved. And so now we have thousands, thousands of teen judges, and it's working wonderfully. We also recently passed the law which allowed 17-year-olds who will be 18 by November 4th to vote in the primary. The argument being, well, if they're going to get to vote in the general, they should also be able to vote in the primary. And as you might have noticed, in Chicago and Cook County, we had thousands and thousands of the 70-year-olds sign up just a few months ago. And the technology front, we have other, other things now. We have something called online mail ballot application. Now, what that means, like, let's say you want to vote by mail. But instead of sending these cards, and then you send in a paper card, and we've got to do all this, and then we send you back the ballot, now it can all be done online. You just go online and say, I want to vote by mail. You send it to us. We send you the ballot. So that is new. That's available as we speak. More important is online voter registration. Illinois joined the states making this change again this summer. Now, we may not see as much yet, but it's really a wonderful tool. And it's not just the kids because a lot of people now use your tablet, use your phone, and you can register online. When California did that a couple of years ago, they had hundreds of thousands of people that registered in the last few weeks. So it'll be good for the future because there's so much more mobility out there. Other things in terms of uh, technical advances, a strong web presence. That's important. We try on our website. If you live in suburban Cook, cookcountyclerk.com. If you live in Chicago, chicagoelections.com. All the election officials are trying to do better on that because it's important. You're going to vote and you may not realize, I mean the experts here do, but you may not realize that ballot is extremely long. And you've got 70 some retention judges of which you probably don't know a single name, maybe one or two. Uh, there's other judges, so it's a long ballot. Be prepared to go a long time. Um, of course, if you choose to skip things, that's okay. We'll count the ones that you do vote. But on the website, it can show you. You can, you can go in and you can see your virtual ballot. Because you may not realize who these candidates are, or who's your state rep candidate, um, this or that. So it's all, all things that we can do. And the newest stuff, because we've got a great videographer on our staff now, is we do all these videos. It's a great learning tool. You know, it's, you know, you listen to me talk, it's one thing, but it's another thing for, we have a targeted thing for our judges, or you want to understand something in five or seven minutes. So we've got lots of videos about voting and other issues. Accessibility, of course, is much better because of the great um, action uh, of the community over the years to provide options for people um, who can't see or have other physical ailments that make it difficult for them to vote. So fortunately, there's a lot of improvements there. So these are a lot of victories, but there's more to do. For example, Right now, there's an estimated 2 million people in Illinois who are eligible but not registered. In 2010, four years ago in this hot governor's race, Pat Quinn got 1.745 million votes. Bre uh, Senator Bill Bradley Brady had 1.713, very close. 
But that means there are more eligible but unregistered voters than either major candidate received. Okay, that's pretty, pretty shocking. Now, why is that? Part of that, you know, there's always some people that don't vote, but part of it is we're extremely mobile society. Each year, roughly a half a million people move in and outside of Cook County. Uh, another 150,000 move uh, to Cook County from outside other places uh, or from other states. Uh, many of those moving, you know, happen to be low income, uh, sometimes minority, uh, because they tend to be renters more than owners. And often these people do not know they need to register. So we're promoting a new program, which you may or may not heard of. We've got a little flyer outside uh, called All In. Now, it's not, it's not sexy, but it's important, and it may achieve an important end. And that is to use modern technology to register all these eligible citizens. We believe it can be done. I Meaning instead of having 25% of all the people in Illinois eligible but not registered, we can get that to 98%. How are we gonna do it? Right now, so much what we do is done with pen and paper. Um, now with online voter registration, things like that gives an opportunity for new things. Remember those two million people that I talked about a moment who were not registered in 2010. Each of those people interacts with government every year. They might get a birth record from my office. They might pay their taxes, might renew their car stickers. Car stickers alone, 11 million people every year have to interact with the Secretary of State's office. All in, or at least our goal here, would make sure that all of those transactions, all those 11 million bought stickers, we can automatically, electronically update their registration. Why not do that? Instead, we spend thousands of hours registering people over and over again. Um, so there's ways to do it. A modern government should not have redundant and inaccurate list of its voters. And so an efficient government would use technology to save time and improve record keeping. So that's what we hope is gonna happen with all in. It's a struggle going on. We're getting lots of, lots of help with it. So uh, kind of a, winding this thing up, I'm, I'm proud of course what we've done, but I wanna emphasize again, because I, I care so deeply about this, that these are great things that many of you in the audience have been doing. But if we don't deal with this issue of the money, we're gonna be swimming upstream. And so when we think about how daunting that is, we got the court against us, okay? We got billionaires more or less against us. How do we deal with that? Well, all I can do is, is uh, a speaker before me gave the kind of rousing uh, conclusions. Uh, just think of it like this, okay? It took a long time for the ideals of our Constitution to actually become a reality. There was a time when people uh, said that we'd always have slavery. There was a time when people said that uh, women did not have the judgment required to vote. Uh, a time when people thought marriage equality was never going to happen. A time when people said you could not have successfully blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians living in a community. Well, we happen to be in one that does a pretty darn good job. So if you think reforming our campaign system is beyond our, our power, just keep those things in mind and remember we are the nation that turned the vision of a great dreamer and reform into reality, whether it was cleaning up the stockyards, whether it was preserving the wilderness so millions of citizens every year could go to these national parks, whether protecting the elderly with Social Security and Medicare, or remember that we're the first nation that sent people to the moon. And we are the people. We're the people who can reinvigorate, reinvigorate one of our most important gifts, and that is real democracy. And I know the people in this war, uh, room are going to be working on it. I know ADA will and the other sponsoring organizations. We've got a lot to do. I'm confident we'll get it done, and thank you.